Join Wondery Plus to listen to Secret Sauce one week early and ad-free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. So, John, uh, when did you know you wanted to go into business? Like, was there some aha, eureka moments uh, when you're super little? Yeah, so when I was 13, my uncle gave me my first Apple MacBook and I just went down this entire wormhole of Steve Jobs documentaries. I was just watching all of them, watching them over again. And I kind of caught the bug. I'm like, I want to try this whole business entrepreneurship thing. Yeah, I definitely had my Steve Jobs phase too. Um, but I want to talk to you about a different business icon, Warren Buffett, who beat out your 13-year-old aspirations because he started to invest before he was a teenager. So it's 1942. Omaha, Nebraska, and Warren Buffett is 11 years old. Wait, hold on. I'm pretty sure Warren Buffett's been like 70 for the past 70 <laughs> years. Yeah, he has this Benjamin Button thing going in my mind too. But he was once a child, and he actually was a lot of things before he became the Warren Buffett we know today. And this story starts when he's just a scrawny kid about to make his first investment and his first mistake. So Warren is this dweeby 11-year-old, and he's walking down the street with his sister, Doris. She's two years older than him, and they're on their way to school. But he's not thinking about baseball or the next science project. He's actually on a mission to try to convince his sister to invest in a stock with him. Normally, that would be pretty weird for an 11-year-old, but this is Warren Buffett we're talking about yeah. here. So Yeah, exactly. And what Warren is doing is he's asking Doris to put all of her savings all of the allowance she's earned over the years, and invest with him. And that's a big deal, especially in 1942. Like, the U.S. still hasn't fully recovered from the Great Depression. They just entered World War II. There's all this uncertainty in economic insecurity. And yet, we have tiny Warren Buffett here who still wants to buy stocks. Doris probably thinks he's crazy. Yeah, you're probably right. But even during all this financial turmoil and literal war, Warren's already earning his own money. He's raised $120 by selling gum and soda door-to-door -door and peanuts at the ballpark. Like, $120 is almost $2,000 in today's money. Yeah, like, he is a tiny little 1940s hustler. But the thing is, he's not satisfied. He wants to see his money grow. I think looking at his family history, you can kind of understand why. Because Warren's family was actually really, really poor when he was a baby. He grew up waiting in line for hours for food rations during the height of the Great Depression. But his dad worked hard and pulled them out of poverty. So seeing his family and all of America suffer, I'm sure it makes little Warren like that much more determined to build his wealth at a young age. Yeah, and he's decided that the best way to start building his wealth is to invest his entire savings and his sister's savings in a stock called City Service Preferred. I mean, that's the most adult-sounding stock I've I ever know. heard of. Like, that's, <laughs> take my money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like, he doesn't really actually have that much info on it. He actually just overheard his dad talking about it. Tiny Warren's mind is like, okay, my dad likes the stock. Sounds super adulty, you know, city service preferred. And that's all I need to know, right? So, hey, Doris, trust me. What a guy. What a guy. So convincing, in fact, that he gets Doris to say yes. Woohoo! Does it start raining Benjamins? Not quite. The woohoos turn to boohoos because the stock goes down and down and down. Oh my gosh, like, is Warren freaking out right now? Totally freaking out. But the thing is, he doesn't care about losing his own money. He cares about his sister's money and letting her down. I mean, Doris did trust him with all of her savings. Like, it must be a huge deal to him. Yeah, and it also goes beyond, like, financial disappointment. At home, their mother is always flying into rages, screaming at every little thing they do, right or wrong. Warren gets his fair share of verbal abuse, too. But the brunt of it is directed at Doris. And all Warren can do is just stand by and watch. That's awful. Like, I also imagine he must feel protective of his sister. Like, now he's letting her down in this other way by losing her money. And maybe he felt like this was something he could actually control, unlike their home life. Exactly. And you know what? The stock actually recovers. And so he sells it immediately, making them a $5 profit. Hey, I mean, that's like 80, 85 bucks a day. So 
could be worse. He made the money. Yeah, but the thing is, the stock doesn't stop there. It starts soaring. I bet he's beating himself like, why didn't I just wait? Why didn't I just hold? Yeah, I know, exactly. And so he vows to never make the same mistake again. And it's a promise he keeps to this day. He learns a lot from this early blunder about patience, research, responsibility, and he'll never again let fear guide his investing decisions. This first lesson is the rue that makes up his secret sauce on his journey to becoming one of the most successful and richest businessmen alive. From Wondery, I'm Samuel Donner. And I'm John Fry. And this is Secret Sauce. In this series, we're exploring Warren Buffett, one of the most famous business tycoons in history. Yeah, you can say that again. He's the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway and beloved for his philanthropy and one of the richest people on the planet. But his secret sauce isn't just made up of investment models and economic theories like you'd think. His values, the people he surrounds himself with, and even the way he deals with scandals, it's all part of it. So we're going to splash around, might get a little sticky, and try to get a taste of what makes Warren Buffett such a success. This is episode one of three of The Secret Sauce of Warren Buffett. Ingredient number one, trusting your inner scorecard. Okay, so I just need to understand, like, what kind of child starts investing when they're only 11 years old? Shouldn't he just be playing baseball or something? Yeah, uh, it's the kind of kid whose favorite book is The World Almanac and the one who used a toothbrush as a toy and played with it for hours with this intense focus. I wonder what he was doing. Like, was it a spaceship? Was it like a soldier? What was he doing with a toothbrush for hours? (laughs) I have no idea. But the thing is, like, Warren was born into a pretty tough time. He was born 10 months after the Great Crash of 1929. And he's also a kid who watched his dad open a stockbroking business and take them from penniless to middle class. And back then, the middle class was hardly even a thing. Everyone must have thought he was crazy to be a stockbroker in the middle of the Great Depression. I mean, I would have thought he was crazy. Yeah, exactly. But that's why his dad is his hero. He did something that most people thought was impossible. He must have been inspired by his dad's grit. Like, this is the picture of the American dream back then. Like, he's showing Warren that anything is possible. Yeah, and, like, Kid Warren actually has the gall to turn to a friend one day and say, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 35. Okay, you're kidding me. He does that in the middle of a depression? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it's insane. And he has this confidence because he reads a lot, and he read a book called 1,000 Ways to Make $1,000, and it changes his life. It's no longer just a pipe dream to make a million dollars anymore. He actually does the math and comes up with an age 35. Now all he needs to do is compound his money through investing. Okay, that sounds great in theory and everything, but I'm sure this journey isn't just peaches and dollar bills. Yeah, no. Uh, (laughs) When Warren's about 13, his dad becomes a congressman and the whole family moves to D.C. And Warren hates it. I mean, I would too if it was me. I'd feel totally uprooted. Yeah, I mean, he's angry with the world. He's not making any friends. And he's kind of a weird kid by this point in 1944. He's reading stock charts in class instead of paying attention to the teacher. So he's always getting in trouble. And it's just because he's not focusing on school. He's actually failing. Okay, in defense of Tiny Warren here, lots of leaders and geniuses did terrible in school or just straight up hated it. Like, look at this club. Walt Disney... Albert Einstein, Richard Branson. like Sure, but did all those guys flirt with a life of crime? Okay, pause. Are you telling me <laughs> that Tiny Warren is a criminal? Uh, yes, kind of. So he starts hanging out with a couple of other bored, angsty kids, and they're restless and looking for trouble. But, like, there's nothing for them to do in D.C. except go to the Sears department store. I can just see them just slinking around all the clothing racks and just walking past the lunch (laughs) counter where all the well-adjusted kids from their school are sitting, just laughing and flirting with the girls in their blazers. Well, (laughs) those guys are over there, right? And initially, it's all in the up and up until they reach the sports section where they steal the place blind. He has a fun little term for it. It's called hooking. And what do they steal? They steal golf equipment. Hundreds and hundreds of golf balls. 
The thing is, Warren doesn't even know why. I would at least think he'd resell it or something. No, no, he's just lost. He's stealing just to steal, and he's shoving them all into his bedroom closet. Until one day, his dad catches him. Oh, God. Papa Buffett. Yeah. And, like, the thing that happens next is even more out of character, because Warren actually lies to his dad. <gasps> he tells him something convoluted about his friend's dad dying and finding all his golf balls. So, what does his dad say? Well, his dad tells him, I know what you're capable of. You can either keep behaving this way, or you can do something in relation to your potential. Wow. Well played, Dad. That's got to be one of the best parental guilt trips ever <laughs> because he's disappointing his dad. I mean, he's been shoplifting and failing school, and now he's lost his dad's approval, which is everything to him. This has got to be rock bottom for Warren. Yeah, definitely a low point. But, like, silver lining is we know that his dad just really believes in him. Mm. He sees his potential no matter how many golf balls Warren steals. He just knows Warren is made for greatness. And I bet Warren knows his dad is right. He's not living up to his potential by stealing a thousand golf balls. And it sounds like maybe his dad is Warren's first secret sauce ingredient. What do you think? Oh, most definitely. Having a parental figure who really believes in you and provides like one of those first examples of a role model of how to live, that's just so important. And it honestly kind of reminds me of my dad because he was one of those first role models that I had mm. growing up. But Warren's dad, he actually gives Warren a lesson that he's going to carry with him his whole life and into every business venture. He tells Warren about the scorecard. Okay, I'll take the bait. What is a scorecard? Is that like a money ball thing or something? <laughs> no, no, not at all. You actually have a choice. You can have an inner scorecard or an outer scorecard. You know what, John? Uh, read this, because it's how Warren describes it. I say, look it. If the world couldn't see your results, would you rather be thought of as the world's greatest investor, but in reality, you have the world's worst record? Or be thought of as the world's worst investor when you're actually the best? Okay, so basically, don't care what other people think. Yeah, like the idea is it doesn't matter what other people think of you, as long as you can look in the mirror and be proud of what you see. Do you meet your own standards, not others? Damn, pretty great. But there was still some hard truth here. Like, who doesn't care what people think of them at least sometimes? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I do it too. But Warren sees his dad as an example of a 100% inner scorecard guy. His dad always acts with integrity, but doesn't care if anyone sees it. And as his dad puts it, if you know why you're doing what you're doing, that's good enough. And I think this might be part of his secret sauce, trusting your inner scorecard. Yeah, I think it's about trusting what's intrinsically valuable. Mm, totally. He has to follow his principles in order to become one of the richest people on Earth, right? Yeah. So around 1946, Warren is in high school and he starts to get his act together. But he's still having a hard time making friends. Adults love him, but fellow students think he's an absolute weirdo because he's just out of sync with people. So, John... What do you do if you're Warren Buffett and you want to make friends? I mean, buy them? Just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, how about analyzing spreadsheets? <laughs> yeah, that's basically right on the money. He reads a famous early self-help book from Dale Carnegie called How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think I remember reading some of those rules in a blog once, like smile and be a good listener. The first principle is don't criticize, condemn, or complain. The book gives Warren a checklist of these social cues that he was missing, and he tracks the results of his tests. That makes sense for him. It's a quantifiable approach to people. Yeah, and for most people, they would think, like, this is a really weird <laughs> robotic way to view humans. Yeah. But it works for him. He starts making friends, and he feels more confident. He even joins the golf team. It's awesome that he's pushing himself to do this at such a young age. Yeah, and he brings these new friends that he's making into his business ventures. He has all sorts of businesses going at this time. He's selling refurbished golf balls. Yeah, refurbished. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, he's also buffing cars. He's installing pinball machines and barber shops. He even buys a hearse, yes, a funeral car, with a friend as an investment. And once he even picks up a date in it wearing a raccoon fur jacket. Hey, Buffett is balling out here, baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, I can imagine how well that date went. Like, he does not sound the smoothest with ladies. No, not 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 chick magnet. But it actually is going well for the money-making part. 
He's making more than his high school teachers. Wow. And from this point on, he hardly ever goes into business without a partner. So he's a bit smug by this point. With some good reason. Yeah. So, I mean, he flies through college in three years. And with all that confidence, he applies to Harvard Business School. But then he goes to Chicago for his interview. Uh-oh. Yeah, I can see him just sitting in the big leather chair, like barely filling out his dad's hand-me-down suit with a goofy smile, just rambling on about how good he is at investing, like thinking he's impressing some Harvard folks. I bet he's not taking any cues from the interviewer whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. The thing is, Harvard is looking for leaders, and that's just not where Warren's at right now. As smart as he is, he's still just a naive kid. So they end the interview after only 10 minutes and tell him, you're too emotionally immature. Ouchie. They tell him, oh, why don't you try again in the future? Man, this doesn't make sense. Warren Buffett, a Harvard reject? Yep, Warren is devastated. But the thing is, Warren later says this rejection was the best thing that has ever happened to him. Saucers, if you're a business owner who's hiring, you face a lot of challenges when it comes to finding the right person for your role. Yeah, it can be super hard. Like there's like a ton of resumes to sift through. Sometimes you're looking for someone who has like experience driving a golf court and then can like blow an air horn right when golf people are about to swing so you can win the PGA tournament. Yes, that is a critical skill that is hard to hire for. Yeah, super hard. And for all those reasons and more, hiring can feel like trying to find a golf ball in a massive sand pit. Yeah, sand pit. And like, sure, you can post your job to some job board, but then all you can do is hope the right person comes along. Yeah, that sounds absolutely terrible, Sam. So what you want to do instead is try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash sauce. That's right, because when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job sites with just one click. And then their matching technology finds people with the right skills and experience, like your guy with the air horn that drives around in that golf cart, for the job and actively invites them to apply. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So while other companies overwhelm you with all these options and all these people who can't honk at the appropriate time on a golf course, ZipRecruiter finds you what you're looking for, the needle in the haystack or the golf ball in the sand pit. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash sauce. One more time, this is the place to get it done ZipRecruiter.com slash S-A-U-C-E. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So it's 1951, and Warren is now a student at Columbia University. All the other students are mostly older than Warren. He looks like he's 16 and acts even younger. But there's this rapport between him and the professor that the other kids can't deny. Teacher's pet. Yeah, basically. His professor is Ben Graham, and he's the reason why Warren decided to go to Columbia. Warren says studying with him was like learning baseball from a fella who was batting 400. And for our non-baseball fans, 400 means pretty good. Yeah, so he reads Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, a dozen times. And when he found out that Graham was teaching at Columbia, he wrote a letter that said something like this. I thought you were dead or a Mount Olympus, but since you're alive here on Earth, it would be swell if I could study with you. Okay, that is quite the letter. And Ben Graham, I'm pretty sure he's known for coining the term value investing, right? Wait, John, value investing, we got to define that. Can you give us a little explainer? Nah. Instead, here's an award-winning celebrity to explain this highly complex and incredibly boring business concept for us. Ha! Just kidding, everyone. It's still me. Okay, Jeeves, give me the champagne. I need it for this explanation. Okay, so this basically means buying underpriced stocks. Let's break it down with this analogy. Let's say you have an overrated actor, like Tom Cruise, and an underrated actor, like Adam Driver. Most people would bet on Tom Cruise, right? But most people are not paying attention to the Adam Drivers of the world. But once he comes out in Star Wars, he's going to be big. 
So Ben's idea is do a ton of research to find who these Adam Driver stocks are. And then once they finally meet everyone's expectations, you're going to make a huge profit. And that profit is what Ben Graham calls the margin of safety. And Graham is very risk averse. So he always preaches not to use debt to invest and to always keep that margin of safety super wide. That was a brilliant explanation. And the way you explained it, it sounds just so easy. Uh, wrong. To find those companies, <laughs> you need a lot of intensive research. You basically have to become a detective just scrutinizing years of financial records. It's a mathematical and systematic approach. So basically uh, tailor-made for Warren's brain. Yeah. The whole philosophy opens up his mind, and he starts learning about every business. And that means reading Moody's manuals. Oh, right. Like those stock manuals, right? They give stats on stocks and bonds. Yeah. And he's going to his first shareholder meetings. Warren has found his hero in Graham, and he sees a path forward for himself. This also sounds like another secret sauce ingredient for me. Find your heroes and stock them and write strange letters. <laughs> exactly. Warren keeps trying to stick close to Graham. When he graduates, he asks Graham for a job. His teacher is impressed with Warren's tenacity and brilliance, but Graham turns him down. Wait, why? This seems like the perfect match. Well, it's because Graham only hires Jewish people because other investment firms won't. Ah, uh, yeah, I see. That makes sense. Post-World War II, anti-Semitism is rampant and no space is free of it, especially the business world. And the civil rights movement is still far off. Yeah, Warren's eyes are opened. Graham shows him, through his rejection, an act of resistance that a businessman can take. And I think that actually influences him down the line. Yeah, I really respect that. And I'm curious to see how that's all going to unfold. But I'm guessing Ben Graham isn't quite the stepping stone that Warren had thought. Not yet, anyway. So Warren goes back to Omaha, where his heart is. I can just see him hunched over at a little tiny desk, just nose deep in Moody's manual, <laughs> looking for all these undervalued stocks. Yeah, and it's all right at first. But soon Warren finds that there's this inherent conflict of interest in stock brokerage. Really? What's the conflict? Well, he realizes that sometimes what's best for the clients is to hold a stock for a couple decades. But if they never sell, the stockbroker will never get another commission. Oh, that's right. But most clients don't know that, right? They also probably don't know that firms like that make a profit by selling the stocks at a markup. Yeah, and to make matters worse, his first client is his Aunt Alice. No, not Auntie. The whole thing must have sent his moral compass haywire. The inner scorecard is getting very bad marks right now. Right. And to top it off, he has these potential clients coming in. And Warren, with his crew cut and saggy socks, blabs to them about stock options. Yikes. He's a bit arrogant, but also pretty brilliant. But to them, it looks like it's coming from the mouth of a child, even though he's 21. At a certain point, a client interrupts him and asks, what does your dad think? That sounds awful. Yeah. Warren is just putting people off. He's still struggling to overcome his biggest hurdle, his social awkwardness. And no amount of studying self-help books is making it go away. It's debilitating at this point, both at work and his very lacking social life. Right. He has the business skills, but he does not have the people skills at all. No, not at all. But I will say one thing about Warren. He knows he has the smarts, but he also knows he doesn't have the social charisma. And not everyone is self-aware of their limitations the way he is. Right. And he decides that in order to be a successful businessman, he's going to need to be able to speak to people with ease. So he forces himself to confront his worst nightmare, public speaking. Warren literally throws up when he has to speak and arranges his entire life to totally avoid it. Oh, God. <laughs> and to be fair, I'm pretty sure that most people's fear is public speaking, especially entrepreneurs in the tech world. But you have to speak in public, right? If you're going to go out and raise funding and schmooze investors. Exactly. So he enrolls in the Dale Carnegie public speaking course. This was a popular course back then based on Carnegie's ideas and lectures. Yeah. And obviously, Warren is already a fan since Dale Carnegie's book helped him make friends in high school. Warren already tried to go to this class once, but chickened out. And so this time, he has a plan. 
He goes to the Rome Hotel where they're holding the class and shoves a hundred bucks in cash at the instructor, handshaking, and says, take it before I change my mind. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, I'm just picturing Warren sitting there just tapping his foot filled with every butterfly on the planet. <laughs> and probably everyone else's debilitating shyness is just amplifying his own. It's like a wet fog of awkwardness just hanging in the room. The teacher has a few tricks up his sleeve. He makes them do things like stand up on tables and give a speech. Like improv tricks. Yeah, and this class changes Warren's life. He says it's the most important degree he has. Okay, who needs Columbia? And this class comes in handy in so many areas of his life, including his love life. Ooh, but uh, intrigue. what does that have to do with anything? All right, John, don't give me that look. This is not tabloid gossip. I promise it has everything to do with Warren's secret sauce, his successes, and his philanthropy. Okay, okay. Break it down for me. So Warren has fallen hard for a hometown girl named Susie Thompson. Ooh. This rosy-cheeked brunette is different from anyone he's met. Warren's 21, she's 19, but he still acts like a kid. Somehow, through all this social awkwardness and weirdness, he convinces her to go on a date with him. Oh boy, I kind of have a feeling like this isn't going to go super well. <laughs> he's got to be very nervous. Yeah, you're right. And his go-to when he's nervous? He talks nonstop. And what does he talk about? Stocks. No, no, Warren, don't do that. Worse, he also tells her rehearsed jokes and brain teasers. Oh, God, that is terrible. I know this is the 1950s and all, but that cannot be a smooth move even back then. And also, when Susie looks at Warren, she sees a kind of dull, privileged kid. He's interested in money, and that's all he cares about. He has no obstacles in life, and he's had such a sheltered upbringing in a way, and she just can't connect with him. What she wants to do is she wants to help people. She has this insatiable giving spirit, and Warren doesn't seem to need anything from her or in life. But finally, Susie draws Warren out of his shell. Oh, that's pretty sweet, actually. I imagine she must be pretty good at people to draw someone like Warren out of his shell. Yeah, she asks about his parents, and he responds well. He starts being honest and tells her his childhood wasn't amazing. Suddenly, the brick wall she's encountered the whole night. It softens and outpours all of this truth. Up until this point, he's always been afraid that what his mom made him believe is true, that maybe he is worthless. But talking to Susie, she makes him feel that, hey, maybe that's not true after all. She has this entirely different perspective in the world and clearly knows how to read people, but also how to listen and support them. Yeah, she sees that Warren is actually vulnerable and insecure. Under all that nerdy swagger, he's lovable. And you know what Susie says of him? What? I had never seen anyone in so much pain. This love fest goes on, and he eventually proposes. Go, Warren. And I think I'm getting where you're going with all this love business. Susie obviously wants to help Warren grow up and become the Warren that we know today. The way Warren says it, she literally saved my life. She put me together. I think she shows him how to be in the world. She helps him see beyond himself and his obsessions. This has to be part of his secret sauce, finding a person who's complementary to your skill sets like Susie. Yeah, I think Susie just fills in all of Warren's blind spots. Yeah. Like Warren is analytical and just like straight to the point. And Susie is more empathetic and caring, you know, like you need both. And it's not unlike when you're starting a company, you need a co-founder with complementary skill sets, right? And she's going to help pull him out of his shell. And he knows that he's going to need those business skills to succeed, right? Exactly. So Warren marries his sweetheart. And soon another dream of Warren's comes true. Ben Graham, his professor and hero from Columbia, finally offers Warren a job. Yes, tiny Warren chasing his big old dreams. Yeah, I'm excited, so is Warren, and he and Susie move to New York and just start popping out babies, as you do in the 50s. And while Susie's home with their daughter, Susie Jr., Warren is loving his new job. He doesn't care that he's shoved into this windowless office with another guy. He's just proud to get to wear the same jacket as Ben Graham. Okay, interesting. So Graham's helping him out with his fashion sense? Yeah, actually, all eight employees wear these gray jackets that look like little lab coats. Ah, uh, I know this sounds weird, but I kind of want one. 
Yeah, me too. I think we should get some secret sauce lab coats with our show logo. hey So Warren soaks up everything he can from Graham, and he gets really good at using Graham's model to buy cigar butts. Okay, gross. And I should say here that these aren't actually cigar butts, but I've actually read all about those. John, I think we need another breakdown for a fine secret saucers. Okay, you're right, Sam. Jeeves, come back over here and pour me some more champagne. Graham is not buying literal soggy ends of cigars, which would be disgusting, but he is metaphorically. So imagine you're walking down the road and you find a cigar butt and it has one last puff in it. Graham is basically searching and finding all of these companies that will fail in the long term, but are priced super, super low and have a one time return on his money, one last final puff. So he buys them at a discount, makes a quick buck, and then he dumps it. So based on that breakdown, I got a hunch that Warren is making bank doing this. Yeah, but he's not acting like it. He and Susie live way below their means. He even makes a deal with a newsstand to buy their discarded papers at a discount. He's that cheap. They live in a modest apartment outside of the city, but his annual salary is $12,000, which is three times the average median income then. Yeah, and in today's dollars, that is definitely six figures. Right, but their neighbors have no clue how wealthy they are. Aha, the inner scorecard strikes again. Warren isn't doing this for anyone but himself, right? He doesn't care what other people think or his social status. You got it. Like, to Warren, collecting money is like the game he wants to win. And he's going to win it by compounding his money over time. Right, meaning don't spend it, invest it, and watch it grow. Exactly. And Susie also doesn't care about status, but she has a little different opinion of money than Warren. For her, it's something to be spent. Exactly. I mean, you got to be ballin'. Yeah, but she's not trying to spend it on fancy clothes. She wants to actually help people. And this is a thing that comes up again and again throughout their lives. It's a tension point. Right. The ever-present question, what is all this money for? Yeah, I think that's something they're still trying to figure out. So a couple years later, Warren's mentor, Ben Graham, retires. And Warren has done so well that Graham asks him to become a junior partner. But Warren turns it down. Wait, what? Isn't this like his dream job? Yeah, like he moved to New York for Ben. But now he's learned all he can. Plus, he doesn't want to be a junior partner to anyone. His dreams are far bigger. When you're managing a team, it can be hard to get everyone on the same page, especially when your freelancers go rogue. Now, don't get us wrong. We're not knocking freelancers. But sometimes it feels like it can be tough to find great ones. Exactly. But with our sponsor, Fiverr Business, it's easy to find and manage top talent. That's right, John. Fiverr Business gives you access to an all-star team of super freelancers. Sounds like a little superhero. Plus, all the tools and support you need to easily integrate them into your existing workflow. Yeah. To start with, they've got a team of dedicated business success managers that'll help match you with the best talent for your team. No more endless guessing in interviews. Once you've found the perfect freelancer, whether you're hiring someone to design a logo or for voiceover, data entry, translation, anything you can dream up, with Fiverr Business, you can collaborate with your team, manage projects, and share freelancers all in one workspace. I'm actually, uh, John, I, 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 I think you know, but I, I've been in the midst of recruiting this past week mm -hmm. and finding great talent has been a nightmare. And interviewing all these people has been insane, like finding great writers, finding editors, yeah. finding outreach people. Big headache. And Fiverr is definitely something that has helped me expedite that process. Every time I need to find someone, Fiverr just makes it easier. Yeah, collaborating online hasn't been this easy since, well, Ever, really. <laughs> yeah. And right now, you can sign up for Fiverr Business absolutely free for the first year. Get one year free and save 10% on your purchase on Fiverr Business with the promo code SAUCE. Just go to fiverr.com slash business and don't forget promo code SAUCE. So it's now 1956 and we're back in Nebraska. And Warren is sitting at a long table with six of his closest people. His aunt Alice, sister Doris, father-in-law, college roommate, college roommate's mother, 
and a childhood friend. These are his first investors in his new investing partnership, Buffett Associates Limited. Right, an investment partnership. So he's basically managing a group of people's money pooled together like a hedge fund rather than just one client at a time. Yeah, but hedge funds often make risky investments off borrowed money and debt, and that's just not Warren's style. Yeah, and these people trust Warren, and they're about to give him a lot of money hoping that he'll be able to make it grow. Exactly. So Warren takes a bite of his steak and potatoes and then lays down the rules of the partnership. And there's three. The first is he isn't going to tell them what companies he's investing in. The second is they can only withdraw their money at the end of each year. And third, probably most importantly, this meal is not on him. They're going Dutch. Okay, only Warren Buffett wouldn't pick up the bill at a meal like this where he's pitching investors. I think I'm going to start doing that with everyone and save myself some money. But the thing is, that's how he saves so much money up until this point. And these rules he's laid out, they're like completely different from any other hedge fund or partnership. They're wholly Warren. Right. He doesn't want to have that conflict of interest, which he hated as a stockbroker. Yeah, exactly. So he creates a system where he's free to make decisions without anyone breathing down his neck. And he evades criticism if the investment doesn't go well in the short term. Win-win. This way, he can make these long-term decisions that he's very, very confident about. It reminds me of back when he was 11 years old and sold his sister's stock too soon. So I totally get why he wants to keep the money invested. But that rule about not telling people where their money is invested, it kind of comes off a little... Like a Ponzi scheme? Yeah, like, I'm smelling a hint of Bernie Madoff here, like, just (laughs) a little whiff. Definitely. And people are talking. They're like, he'll be broke in a year. To most, he's still just a weirdo. And because of all this, he's even barred from the Omaha Country Club. <gasps> How dare they? <gasps> I know. I mean, he and Susie are nonconformists and anti-elitists, so they really could care less about their social status. Which is pretty awesome. Yeah. The thing is, when Warren hears all these rumors flying around about him, he doesn't defend himself. Yeah. I don't know if I would be that strong. I would probably write an op-ed, you know, the tweets of the day, just telling everyone, I'm right. What are you talking about? But I guess this is the inner scorecard at work, right? Yeah, exactly. So Warren keeps his head down and just works his ass off. And his willpower actually pays off. He does really well in his first year, making these Graham-like investments super low risk. And his partners are happy. And because of all this, his reputation starts to spread. And the word that's spreading is honesty. Yeah, it seems like his genius is finally but slowly becoming evident to everyone else and his values too. Oh, it definitely is. It's just because Warren stays the course. He's like relentlessly sticking to his values no matter what people say. And eventually the values rise to the surface and people are like, oh, like that guy is a guy with values. And it's just so hard when everyone is talking about you, spreading rumors, kicking you out of freaking clubs. Like he had to go through so much to stick to his inner scorecard. Yeah, but like he doesn't act out of fear, even if a stock goes down, even if people talk shit. He's just like, I'm going to be a tiny Warren or maybe a little bit bigger <laughs> Warren and keep doing my thing. And he does. And he's successful because of it. Yeah. And that combined with his business knowledge, it's probably going to go pretty far. Yeah, it's great for business. But Warren is so focused now on work that he hasn't exactly been present for his three kids and Susie. He comes home for dinner every day, same time, but goes straight up the stairs to work. He's there, but he's not there there. It's kind of sad, and I mean, it is kind of a product of his time kind of situation, right? Yeah, sure, but I don't want to give him like a get-out-of-jail-free card too easily, because think of his dad, right. right? He was actually there for his family as a role model for Warren, and he provided too. So I think in some ways it's just the byproduct of Warren being Warren. But luckily, Susie is the opposite. Yeah, she seems like an empath. Yeah. And while his business is on the rise, her consciousness is on the rise, right? So she keeps asking Warren's permission to give money to help people she sees suffering around Omaha. Like young black students trying to go to college and black families trying to buy houses in white neighborhoods. Wow, she sounds way ahead of her time. Think about it. This is a time when racism was blatantly in the laws. Yeah, Susie's starting to set the stage for extreme giving. Yeah, we all know Warren Buffett as a philanthropist now, but it's sounding to me like Susie deserves a lot of credit for his reputation. 
you are so right. All props to Susie. And yes, but she's not the only person that influences him deeply. During the early years of his partnership, Warren meets his bosom buddy, a man named Charlie Munger. Charlie's this talkative jokester with no humility, and they meet through some mutual friends, probably over a dinner of steak and potatoes. Okay, how does this Warren guy survive? Like, is this the only thing he eats? Where are his nutrients? <laughs> yeah, besides hamburgers, yes. No joke. Anyhow, the four of them are sitting around the table at the Omaha Club, where Warren is no longer blacklisted. Oh, I get it. So now that he's all successful with his stellar reputation around town, they all want him back, huh? Totally. So soon Warren starts talking about his Graham-like investments, and Charlie just gets it immediately. They're like made of the same cloth. And in Warren's eyes, the friends who introduce them just poof, disappear. The world narrows into one spotlight shining on Charlie Munger. This is like a business partner meet cute. Kind of reminds me when we first met, oh, John. Yes. And from there, it was love and podcast at first sight. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> anyway, Charlie, Warren learns, has a very different ideology than his hero, Ben Graham. He sees Graham as a pessimist, buying up dying companies and selling them after one last gasp. Charlie looks at the market with a positive lens. He sees the potential in new companies. Yeah, this seems like a huge and important shift for Warren. If Charlie actually gets Warren to let go of his grip on cigar butts, you know, those dying companies that Ben Graham taught him how to find. Yeah, so he gets Warren to start investing instead in great American businesses. So Warren goes in search of a scuttlebutt. Aha, the scuttlebutt method. I'm pretty sure that's the author and investor Phil Fisher's idea. It's basically about the on-the-ground detective work, interviewing customers, employees, competitors, Finding the merits of a company like good management, growth, potential, all the things that aren't so quantifiable with numbers. Right. And the first one of those is American Express. And the company's stock has just plummeted after a big scandal. So Warren starts buying up the stock as fast as he can until it's his partnership's biggest investment. Wow. So Warren just swoops in and buys during a market crisis, basically. Yeah, that kind of becomes Warren's style, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so customer goodwill, the Amex brand, those are the assets he's betting on here, but there's no exact math for that. It's a very far cry from Ben Graham's numerical approach. Yeah, and it works. He makes a ton of money investing in Amex, which proves to Warren that he is on another path forward. So by 1962, Warren is doing awesome. He has over 100 partners. Wait, 100 partners? Yeah, and he's buying these notable companies. He's comfortable with public speaking. Tiny Warren has really grown up. Oh, and one more thing, John. He's worth over a million bucks at age 32. Okay, wait. That means he beat his goal from when he was a kid, right? Like, he wanted to be a millionaire at 35. Yep. He's on his way to being the billionaire we all know and love. Except... Warren has one more cigar butt left in him, and it becomes what he says is the greatest mistake of his life, Berkshire Hathaway. This is the first of three episodes of The Secret Sauce of Warren Buffett. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review. And be sure to tell your friends. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, The Wondery App, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in The Wondery App to listen ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Please support them. By supporting them, you help us offer you the show for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. I'm John Fry. And I'm Samuel Donner. Carmiel Banoski wrote this story. Our associate producer is Brian White. Sound design was done by Mark Nieto. Additional audio assistance by Adrian Tapia and Matt Fernandez. Our senior producers are Janine Cornelo and Sochi Dorsey. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie for Wondering.